Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I could get you to take your seats now and, uh, and settle down for the uh, second half of the plenary session. Thank you. Still have seats up the front if, um, if anybody needs a seat. That's great. While we've got most people in, I'll, I'll just um, kick things off with the introduction. The, the setup for the rest of the morning is that, uh, that we have two uh, plenary keynote speakers. Uh, Sean Galloway is going to do the first session, uh, and then followed by uh, Dr. Bill Johnson, who'll do the, uh, the second piece. And then we're going to ask both of them to come back up on stage and, uh, and take a seat here. Uh, the text number that I gave you uh, during the, uh, the morning admin brief will be uh, pushed back up on the screen on a number of occasions throughout the sessions. So if you haven't already got a note, then uh, you can make a note and, uh, and put it down. Text your questions. Try to keep them uh, obviously uh, relatively brief. Uh, text your questions in, and then we'll feed them up. And Scott Chappelle uh, uh, is going to facilitate, as I said, the Q&A session when Sean and Bill uh, join us on stage after their uh, individual presentations. So in terms of the, uh, the first speaker, uh, Sean is President and CEO of ProAct Safety, uh, internationally recognized for, uh, for his uh, work in safety excellence, uh, and he's literally helped hundreds of organizations across every major industry. He covers uh, aviation, pharmaceuticals, food, uh, automotive industry, and banking, to name just a few. Uh, he's also the host of a highly acclaimed weekly podcast series, Safety Culture Excellence, He's a columnist for several magazines and co-author of, of several books on safety excellence and, uh, and changing uh, culture on a safety culture basis as well as uh, excellence in performance. Uh, National Safety Council refers to him as a global safety excellence expert and has listed him uh, in the top 40 rising stars of safety. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome Sean to give the first of the, the plenary keynotes. He, uh, he's going to follow the theme of the summit uh, and focus on, or look at uh, focusing on value, not activities, uh, with leadership in difficult times. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to Sean Galloway. Thank you. Good morning. I've been employed since I was 10 years old, I had my first job. My first job was a paper route. I would get up before school at four o'clock in the morning. Papers would get delivered to my home, I'd bundle them. And about 4.30 in the morning, I would set out by myself on my bicycle to deliver paper around the town. Times have certainly changed since then. How many of you put your kids on a bicycle at 4.30 in the morning and send them out by themselves? <laughs> Times have changed. Times are always going to be changing. When we change, when we improve, when we face difficult times, it's easy for us to fall into the more is better trap. We need to do more. Most organizations that I work with and even speak with, more is not always the answer. How do we do things better? How do we make sure we're focused? My first tax paying job, if you will, at 16, my father sat me down and told me something that I've, I've never forgotten. He said to me, Sean, no one will ever owe you a job. You have to show and demonstrate new value every day. And that stuck with me. That's been my work ethic. But it's the value piece. Are we delivering real value? During the financial downturn in the late 2000s, I was working with a lot of organizations that were struggling through this time. Even this past weekend, I've been contacted by a few organizations across multiple countries that have contacted us for help because they feel as though their safety culture is struggling. And I would argue this early in, then perhaps the safety culture wasn't as strong to begin with if it's struggling right now. Like Peter Drucker said, your organizational systems are perfectly designed to give you the results you are currently receiving. So we all have cultures. We all have safety cultures. Safety culture, the term, has only been around since 1986 with two major events that prompted that, the Challenger explosion and Chernobyl. With those two events, the term started to become popular, but we're still not really sure on what safety culture is all about. We're not really sure about what safety excellence is all about. I view that as kind of my role. That's the thing that drives me, is to continuously challenge how we define 
excellence and safety. So during the financial downturn, I was working with an organization that they had been very good in safety, but they felt their culture was starting to slip based on some of the things that they could observe. They had me come in and I was assessing the culture. It was about a thousand person operation in this one location. And we got on the topic of feedback for safety. What are we talking about? What are the conversations like? I was with a group of union members of this organization and this topic led to a conversation I'm never gonna forget. I've led hundreds of these assessments. I wish I could remember details from all of them, but what this one lady said to me, I've never forgotten. Again, we were on the topic of feedback for safety. What are the conversations like? And this is what she said. You know, in a few months, I'm gonna retire after 30 years here. The only time they've ever talked to me about safety is when I've done something wrong. Just once before I retire, I wish they'd tell me when I've done something right. Even though they've had good safety performance, that's why their culture was suffering. I've never seen a company punished into excellence, but that's the trap they had fallen into. Leadership was concerned. How they were acting, how they were coming across was affecting how people were thinking about things. I'd like to share with you, I'd like to share with you a four-focused mindset that has been helpful for several of the companies that I've worked with and how they frame and how they think about things. As we all know, all progress begins by thinking differently. And it's how we come across, how we as leaders, how we come across, our behaviors, what we say, behavioral integrity, what you say matches what you do. Like what Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, what you do speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you say. So how do we come across? It's important that we realize we do need to hold people accountable for certain things, but excellence and safety is not defined by the absence of injuries. We've fallen into that trap in a lot of organizations. If we have zero injuries, we're gonna be excellent in safety. I've seen several organizations that have had zero recordables, zero incidents for a long period of time and then catastrophe occurs. Here's how I define excellence and safety. Excellence and safety is the ability to achieve great results, knowing precisely how you achieved those great results with still a shared mindset that continuous improvement is always possible. A lot of organizations are able to get great results. And the challenge as we start coming out of these times is not our ability to get great results. Many companies, and yours included, has demonstrated that ability. The challenge is knowing precisely how you got there so you can continue with that level of performance, but also know where the improvement opportunities exist. We talked about best practices. We, we heard that this morning already. I've seen several organizations that have purposefully discontinued using that term, best practice, because what they feel is they fall into the cognitive bias. They feel as though they fall into the trap that that must be the way you do things. They've changed the terminology it's just terminology, but the term they're using now is better practices. Because what they're fearful of is if we adopt a best practice, might we stop looking for a better way? There's always going to be a better way. Look in your industry back 10 years, 20 years ago. The things that were viewed as acceptable practices are not viewed as acceptable today because somebody was willing to say there has to be a better way. In North America, when the first high rises were being built in the late 1880s, we used to plan for how many fatalities we would have based on how many floors were being constructed. Thankfully, we don't think that way today. But the way we progress is by realizing there will always be a better way if we search for it. This is why excellence and safety is not just the ability to get great results and knowing how you got there. It's still maintaining the mindset that we can always be better. We can always improve. When I worked with CentOS, one of the terms they use in their corporate culture, I'm always fascinated by organizations that have books written about their culture. CentOS uses the term positive discontent. What that means is we celebrate our successes and we always know we can be better. I think it's a great term to use in an organization. As we're going through the times that we're going through now, the four focus mindset that I wanna start with is the leadership mindset our focus, how we come across. 
we know that if the leaders don't lead, the followers aren't going to follow. Do we come across as confident? I served eight years in the Army, in the United States Army, and I could tell the leaders that were not confident in their plans. Think about how unwilling people are to follow somebody that's not confident. Even if we have the difficult times that we're in, we have to look at how we come across. What's our behavior? If we're viewed as fearful, if we're viewed as uncertain, think about the culture that that creates. So we have to first look at where we're at. What's the leadership style that we have today and what's the leadership style we need to move forward? Leadership style, of course, is situational. It's different based on the situation that you're in. Sometimes we need cajoling and collaboration. That's a critical part of leadership. Sometimes we also do need command and control. On my flight coming out here from Houston yesterday, the flight attendant gets on the loudspeaker and says, in control of our flight today is Captain, I don't want a collaborative flying experience. I want a command and control flying experience. So we have to look at the leadership style that we have and how are we coming across? What are our behaviors? We also have to get past this idea of don't bring me a problem unless we come, unless we have a solution. Now is the time for us to be willing to share what we see, what the challenges are. If we can't air them, we're not gonna be able to determine and collaborate on how to overcome them. We also have to make sure we have the right strategy. Your, most organizations have a strategy in safety. Now is the time to revisit it and say, what's our strategy really focusing on? A major owner operator in the oil and gas sector that I, we've been working with for, for many years, a good friend of mine's in their financial department. They're moving some people around in Houston and they're, they're consolidating some teams. This guy's in the financial group and they decided to go to a team building exercise. They chose bowling. That was the thing they wanted to go do as a team. As they got to the bowling alley, before they went and picked out their bowling balls, they were all promptly set down and told they have to fill out a job safety analysis form. When you disengage the very people whose engagement is critical to be successful, we're not winning in safety. But this is the strategy that we've tended to fall back into, is are we focusing on winning or are we focusing on failing less? The measurements that we use to drive our performance, if they're mostly the lagging indicator performance, it sends the message that it's April, folks, we need to work harder to fail less. That's not a strategy of success. The absence of failure does not necessarily mean the presence of success. But the strategy, if you could show the slide back again, when, in our 2013 book, this is the strategy we find in a lot of organizations still today. It's a four-part strategy. See if you've ever experienced this. Number one, you look at your incident rate. Number two, you set a new incident rate goal or objective. Number three, you develop a list of things to do. Number four, you execute on that and you say, how did we do? The problem with this is actually when we achieve improved performance. We fall into that correlation causation trap we know to try to avoid. We say we've done these things, we had this improved performance, therefore we had this improved performance because of the things we were doing. Not necessarily. Sometimes we're successful in spite of the things we were doing. Sometimes it's normal variation. But if we're doing things to try to improve safety that people don't see the value in, and we're able to achieve improved performance, it's never sustainable, because we end with a culture of have to rather than a culture of want to. So this is the time to relook at the strategy and say, are we focusing on a real strategy or is it a bunch of initiatives and a bunch of things we're doing to try to improve safety with the goal of failing less? Strategy as a business concept has only been around since the early 1960s. It's been a part of military for thousands of years. But I like what Michael Porter, who's written probably the most about strategy, what he writes about that I wanted to highlight here, it's fit among a company's activities. But also what Porter points out is strategy is also about what not to do. What are we not going to do? What are we going to stop doing that doesn't add current value? In our 2015 book, we wanted to reframe how people look at strategy. And that's one of the predictions that we're gonna see a lot of organizations focusing on is developing a real strategy. Strategy is not about failing less. Strategy is are we capturing and delivering value? It's a framework of choices, trade-offs, small bets to determine how we're going to win. 
It's not just about failing less. It's are we adding value to the customers of our safety program and improvement efforts? If they don't see the value in things, we have to look at, well, is our purpose just to drive numbers down or is our purpose to really drive value? Georgia Pacific, the large pulp and paper organization, we've consulted with them for probably 15 years now. Several years ago, they changed the motto, they changed the mission statement of the Global Health and Safety Organization. Their Global Health and Safety mission statement is the following, to continuously improve the quality of life of the employees on and off the job. That's what drives them. It says nothing about incident rates. When they have a new initiative, they will balance that as a qualifier, how is that going to add value to the employees on and off the job? Again, if we're doing things in safety that they don't see value in, sometimes they're not gonna see value in the things that we do. Sometimes there are things that we have to do that add value that the employees may not see it. But if they don't at least understand the perception of it, if they don't see the value, we, again, we end up with cultures of have to rather than cultures of want to. Show the slide for me, please. This is where, in our latest book, real contribu contribution of value over a sustainable period of time, this is where organizations win. Are we capturing and delivering long-term value? So for this, people have to have a vision of success. And this is where we have to reframe how we currently define success in a lot of entities. If success is defined as no injuries, think about what that does from a mindset in the organization. I've argued for years that, with all due respect, zero incident goals can create risk-taking in an organization. Because if people think excellence is defined by zero injuries, here's the perception that we inadvertently allow to exist. If safety means not getting hurt, then anything that I do that doesn't get me hurt must be safe. It's flawed logic. People have to have a real vision of what success looks like. Now, I gave you the 30,000-foot view of excellence, the ability to get great results, etc. We have to look in your operations. You have to be able to drive that down to say, when we have zero injuries, what would we see that's common that tells us why? That's what culture really is. It's what's common in an organization. Common beliefs, common behaviors, common decision, common knowledge, and common stories. Are we doing things that are really adding value? Do people know where we're going? Do people really understand what success looks like in safety? Do they know how to navigate from where they're at to where they're going? It's like what the Cheshire Cat said in Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, then any path will do. We have to define where we're going. That has to be operationally defined to the lowest levels of the organization so they know what safety excellence looks like. And if we can define excellence and safety in what's observable, that means we can coach it. You can't coach results, you coach for performance. And the next step in trying to become excellent in safety, regardless of the times that we're in, is allowing people to understand the destination, to see what it looks like so they know their role in achieving it. They have to be able to understand what success looks like and they have to be able to know where they're going. Then as we measure our progress, we move from just a reliance on lagging indicators, your incident rates and cost. We move towards leading indicators. And in most organizations, leading indicators are measurements of activities in a lot of organizations. And this again, we fall back into that correlation causation trap. We did all these activities, we had improved performance, therefore, there's a next level of measurement that we created several years ago. We just call it transformational indicators. There are better ways to measure the contribution of value between your activities and your results. Let me give an example of that. This is a, an unfortunate experience that happened to me. It's an embarrassing story, but I tell it because I hope you'll see the value in it and it will enhance the way you look at how we measure success and safety. September, to, September 15, 2012, I was out running errands. My younger sister was about to have her first child because whooping cough was coming back around in the United States. They wanted you to get it vaccinated again, even if you were decades ago. I was standing in a grocery store pharmacy waiting to get this shot. Because it was mid-September, it's also flu season, coming upon flu season in Houston. So there were 12 other people that were standing in the pharmacy in front of me. There was no place to sit. 
Now, mind you, when I started that day, I felt healthy. I felt great. I felt top of the world. Nothing's wrong with me. And I, too, have told people the absence of, of visible indicator. I'm sorry, the, just because you don't have anything that's visibly wrong with you in health doesn't mean that you're truly healthy. I've been saying that, and I should have listened to my own advice. So because all the seats were taken, there was only one seat that was open, and it was attached to a blood pressure machine. You can probably tell where the story's going to go. I sat down in this seat, put my left arm in the cuff, and I pushed the red button, and it came back and said 175 over 107. That's in that seek medical attention now category. And I did. There was a first alert clinic right next door, and I went over there, and I was honest with the physician. Probably like a lot of you, I travel a lot. I don't always make the right choices and exercise and diet. I was honest with the physician. She said, you need to lose about 10% of your body weight. You need to change your lifestyle, not a fad diet. You need to get on blood pressure medication. I'll tell you what, I was scared. I bought a home blood pressure monitoring kit. <laughs> I was checking it multiple times a day. But that's where I discovered your blood pressure, while it's a leading indicator, it's transformative. Your blood pressure tells you the contribution of value between your health activities and choices and your health results. Think about if you're already exercising, right? You already have a good lifestyle and you check your blood pressure and your blood pressure is high. The answer isn't more exercise. It's finding the right thing. When we look at our, our efforts in safety, if we're doing things to improve safety, but people don't believe what we need them to believe, if they don't know what we need them to know, if they're not doing what we need them to do, those are better indicators. And sometimes an imprecise measurement of the right thing is better than a precise measurement of the wrong thing. Transformational indicators, when you look at it this way, there are two things. They tell you the most important leading indicator to pay attention to, but they tell you the value between your activities and your results. If we're training somebody on something, are we measuring what we call the safety IQ? Do people know what we need them to know? When I worked at the major government, government institute in, in the D.C. area, they have about 40,000 people coming on their campus every day. They have 30 major safety programs. They were doing a lot of things in safety, but with budget cuts, times are difficult. They need to make sure what we're doing is really adding value. So they went to each one of these program owners and said, you have to be concise. What are the three most important things people should know about this safety program? It took them a while to get the answers to these 90 questions it turned out, and they went out and quizzed and polled a strong sample of the organization. No surprise, people didn't know the most important things, regardless of all the communication and all the meetings. So the answer wasn't, we need to do more, it's how do we make our communication stickier? How do we make it stick? So when you look at strategy, I encourage you to think about, have you defined success and safety? Do people know operationally what it looks like in the role that they do? What is success? Think about the Olympics examples. When the Olympics occurs hours ahead of you, you hear who meddled in an event because all our countries in the room here are chasing the medal count before, because of the time delay, you watch the performance. When you watch that performance, you say to yourself, that's why she got the gold, or that's why he got the silver, because you could see the performance that contributed to the results. We have to define success not just as the results, but the performance that yields it. We have to look at who leads, who manages safety. For safety really to be a value in any organization, it can't be delegated, but people need to know their precise roles and responsibilities. If you can keep the slide up for me for a second. You have to look at the roadmap. Where are we right now and where are we going? Every organization is gonna continuously change. Change is the only thing constant in most organizations. But people need to know what the roadmap is. We need selection alignment of the different programs. Sometimes we need to stop doing things that might be disengaging or demotivating. People are no longer adding new value. We need to make sure that what we measure is value add. Think about the transformational indicators. But we also have to measure progress. A study came out a few years ago that answered the question, what really motivates people in a work setting? That thousands of people keeping a journal, documenting what they were doing when they felt the most motivated and, vote, and the most demotivated. The overwhelming conclusion that it turns out the most effective motivator in a work setting is visible progress towards a goal. Think about the days you've worked hard and felt as though you haven't scratched the surface versus the days you saw progress, things are getting done. How do we show progress and safety if it's only defined by the absence of something? It has to be defined by the presence of something. Are we seeing the things we want? Is the knowledge level increasing? Do people see a sense of progress? 
You have to market safety. No, not for the things that you have to do. There's two types of things that you want people to do in safety. There's two types of behaviors. There's mandatory behaviors and there's discretionary behaviors. You don't say, pretty please, lock out, tag out. We need to market that to you. Those are things you have to do. But if you want discretionary effort, you have to look at how you're currently branding safety. And a brand isn't just a logo. A brand is how somebody identifies with a product, a service, or even person. Your safety efforts have a brand. Are you maintaining that brand? Do people see value in the brand? You have to have an ongoing communication plan. People need to continuously know where they're at. But with strategy focus, you have to make sure, not just in headcount reductions, if you have to go through that, but you have to be selective. You have to be precise in the choices that you make and the things that you might stop doing that's no longer adding value. But also from a people-focused perspective, what people need from you is they need direction. They need to know where are we going and what is it going to look like. On a journey to any, any place, people need to have that sense of progress. We're getting closer, we're going in the right direction. And it's hard to define that. It's hard to allow people to see that unless we clearly define what success looks like and what progress is going to look like. Not perfection, but continuous improvement. People need to have confidence in the leaders. They need to have confidence that they're following the right leaders. They need to have confidence that if we go in this direction, we're going to be successful. And that goes back to why we have to market what we're trying to do in safety. They need encouragement and empathy. Positive reinforcement is a very important thing. We know the importance of positive reinforcement, especially if we're married. <laughs> we know the importance of it. But for some reason, when we come to work, we forget it. Think about in your in your roles, in your career. How sick and tired are you of all the positive feedback you get to work? We know the importance of it, but sometimes we just forget it. And it doesn't need to be something scheduled on an annual basis. Does everybody know who the Dilbert cartoon is? There's a great Dilbert cartoon, pointy-haired boss and Dilbert coming into his office, and the pointy-haired boss was saying, according to my calendar, you're due for a little positive reinforcement. <laughs> doesn't need to be some scheduled thing. We have to look at how we come across. Think about that lady in 30 years, safety conversations was something that you avoid. So we need transparent communication. It needs to be a regular priority. You set the priority as a leader for something based on how often you talk about it. It's not fair, but that's reality. If you talk about safety once a week compared to all the other operational priorities, you send the message that safety is not as important. It's not fair, but that's the reality. We need to be transparent as much as we can and maintain sincerity. People need to know where we're going and what we're challenging because this is a team effort to get through this. Need to know basis, now is not necessarily the time for that. We need to be consistent. We need to stay on message. As we're doing all of this, it's easy for people to get distracted. I'm going to talk more about this in my session this afternoon. There's a fascinating part of the brain called the reticular activating system. This is a part of your brain that's filtering mechanism, that filters in the important things and filters out the other important things. The example they use in science is a new make and model of a vehicle. Have you ever bought a new make and model of a vehicle and over the next few weeks you see it everywhere? Did those vehicles magically appear? Of course not. You're paying attention to it. People's reticular activating system when it comes to safety changes over time based on the things that we're talking about, based on the risks, based on how we frame safety excellence. If we allow people to think safety excellence means not getting hurt, their ability to recognize risk diminishes over time. In our steps book, it's certainly more complex than this, but really what safety is, it's a three-step process. It really boils down to this. Number one, knowing the risks. Number two, knowing the precautions to take to control the risks. And number three, regularly taking those precautions. What are the most important risks right now, either from an injury or fatality prevention, but also as a low probability, high frequency type of exposure? Do people know the most important risks? If you walk up to anybody and say, what's the most likely thing to get you injured? You'd get the right answer. I worked with an organization Every location I went to, everybody told me the things that they were focusing on in safety was steel toe, boot protection, and housekeeping. When we looked at their injuries, if they were perfect at steel toe and housekeeping, they would have had an 8% reduction on their injury rate. I like what Drucker said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. <laughs> a lot of times we do a lot of things on the not most important things. 
How do we keep the most important thing the most important things? As a customer, the customers out there, the external business strategy, as we look to apply it inside an organization, because there's customers of your safety strategy, there's customers of your safety programs, you have to fight through the noise there. But it's not how do we compete with the production mindset, it's how do we deliver real value? How do we stand out of the crowd? But that means we have to have a focus. We have to keep the most important thing the most important thing. I work with a lot of organizations, they just don't have the time to build cultures, they're project-based organizations. So they have to keep the most important things the most important things. What are the most important things you need people to pay attention to in your organization? Do they know it? You could measure that. Are they regularly taking precautions to avoid those things? You could measure that as well. But we have to look at how we stand out. It's not just how do we compete. That's outdated thinking. It's how do we add value. As Carl said this morning, safety adds value. Organizations that get this realize that how we manage safety is an indicator of how we manage the rest of our organization. But as we get better and better in safety, it moves from how do we reduce risk to how do we add value to the business. So we have to get past this mindset of that we need to compete with the other operational activities. And I've seen companies fall into that trap time and time again, where we try to embed safety into every aspect of operational performance. I get that and it makes a lot of sense. But when we add activities and things that people don't see value in, we end up disengaging the very people whose engagement is critical for us to be successful. So we have to look at not just how do we compete, how do we add value? So when you look at communicating this, when you look at taking all the things back after you attend this wonderful conference here, make sure people understand where you're going. Make sure they understand what success really looks like. And it has to be defined not just across the organization, but in each area. It needs to be defined in the language that people use around safety. What would you see as a leader in your area? What would you see when visiting a work being performed that tells you we should expect great safety performance? Now the next question is, is how do we get that in the heads of others? So we have to make sure we communicate this clearly to people. I like what George Barnard Shaw, the Irish playwright said. He said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. We sent signals, we sent an email. Real communication is knowledge transfer. People need to know where we're going and what success looks like. But we also have to have an honest discussion about where we're at and where we've come from. Every organization has evolved in safety over the past 10, 20, 30 years. Every organization has. Change is the only thing constant. People need to know where we're at against where we're going. They need to be able to know precisely what the most important priorities are in safety. It's what I call a one-handed strategy. If you have more strategic priorities and you can fit on one hand, focus is the opportunity. I would rather an organization be great at a few things in safety than mediocre at a bunch, if excellence is their goal. So they need to know where we're going, the most important things that we're gonna be focusing on, because people need to see themselves as an actor in the strategy. You need to make sure that you have the right measurements that tell you, yes, we're getting closer to where we all agree we're trying to go, and the things that we're doing are adding real value. That's the key thing here. It's not a matter of more. Now we don't have time. We don't have the luxury of being more, of focusing on more. It's how do we make sure the things we're doing are adding real sustainable value. That's what strategy is all about. But as you leave this conference, I encourage you to be looking for these better practices. Continuously challenge today's practices, the status quo, looking for better ways. I think when we maintain that mindset, that positive discontent, we celebrate our successes, but we know we can always be better, I think that's how we continue to evolve, and I think it's how it brings us out of the times that we're in right now, when we focus on better practices rather than just adopting a best practice and fall into that stop looking mentality. I think when we look for those better practices, I think we will create new realities to the next generation of leaders that will follow you. Sir Isaac Newton, who discovered the laws of gravity, once said that if I've been able to see further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. I think when we move forward here, and I think the work that you all as leaders will do over the next several years to improve safety, 
I think it will create new realities for the next set of leaders that will follow. I think our children depend on that. I think our grandchildren depend on that. So I ask you when you leave this conference to go forth and be the giants we need to create a better and safer tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Cheers. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, so I'll, um, I'll let Sean uh, depart the stage now. I put the text number up uh, for those that didn't uh, copy it down earlier on. That's the, uh, the, the number to text in your questions. As I say, keep them relatively brief, um, um, and we'll feed them up to the facilitated session later on that uh, Scott Chappelle is going to chair for us. Uh, I also mentioned as well, before I come on to introducing uh, Dr. Bill Johnson, the feedback piece, because it's something I, uh, I omitted to mention this morning during my opening session. For those with the app, you can leave feedback for all of the sessions via the app, and it's really um, uh, simple. It helps us collate it electronically. For, for, the, um, for the other sessions, we do have paper uh, feedback, but uh, in fact, I think I did mention it, but I'm going to stress it. Uh, the feedback's really important for, uh, for plenary session, for all the workshops. Let us know what you got out of them uh, and what you might want to see differently uh, in years to come. So just a plea that will be repeated as we, as we go through. But my thanks to Sean for posing some some interesting challenges for um, uh, perhaps depressing us slightly that we're not doing enough or that we're not doing it uh, uh, frequently enough or uh, in the right manner in terms of feedback to, um, to our teams on safety performance. And maybe we are focusing too much on the bad stuff and trying to figure out rightly why it happened and, and preventing it happening again, but uh, m skimming over the 95% plus of stuff that goes right and the culture that is positive, uh, which is actually going to deliver what we want to deliver. So, to, uh, to hear uh, something on the same lines uh, in terms of the, uh, the economic side and uh, return on investment, uh, Dr. Bill Johnson is going to join us now. And, uh, um, Bill's spent more than 35 years as a uh, senior exec and scientist in private and public uh, engineering and airline companies before joining the FAA, uh, where he is the most senior FAA executive responsible for R&D and technical programs related to human performance in the maintenance and engineering sphere. Uh, by trade, he is uh, an aviation maintenance technician and pilot for more than 50 years uh, and has delivered human factors presentations in over 50 countries. We've been desperately keen to get Bill on the stage at the CAC Safety Quality Summit and we've persevered and I'm grateful that he's continued to try and get here. Uh, this year we're delivering uh, for the first time on this stage. Uh, he's going to look at that, uh, the return on investment challenge where uh, we look at safety being number one, but so is profitability. So uh, they are, are they not, uh, mutually inclusive? But, uh, but how, do we, uh, how do we wrestle any tension that might exist between that? So I, uh, I offer the stage now to Bill Johnson, who will give his presentation, and then we'll join for the Q&A session with Sean. Bill. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, when we took that poll this morning, uh, about, I think about half the people in here raised my, your hand and I raised mine as well. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here for the first time. And gosh, let me speak first thing in the morning. I appreciate that. Someone made the comment, uh, the good thing about speaking first thing is if you screw up by the time people go home, they don't even remember what you said. So, uh, which uh, the advantage of speaking last is they do remember what you said. And I do have a session very late in the day on Wednesday uh, by design. So what I want to do is uh, talk to a, a little bit about um, uh, about four or five topics. It, this is a great speech for if you're a short attention span speaker or a short attention span listener, because I'm going to talk about five separate things, about uh, five minutes each. That's the plan. Uh, so I call it Continuing Solutions to Maintenance and Engineering um, Human Factors Challenges. Here's what we're going to talk about. First of all, what are the challenges? Got, maybe I have the answer. A word or two about uh, safety management systems. And I'm going to uh, offer, uh, for a first time to many of you and for others, review uh, one of my favorite topics, PEAR, uh, and other models that might work for thinking about human factors and or even safety management. And then um, some, what I'm going to call, I'm going to repeat what Mark Skidmore from Australia talked about, a little bit about evolved thinking on the part of the regulator, uh, which in my case will be the FAA. And then, uh, of course, we all do a little promotion. So I'm going to talk ROI very seriously for two 90-minute sessions, both tomorrow and Wednesday. So to be honest with you, I'm going to do a little self-promotion on coming uh, hear more about return on investment. What are the challenges? Well, probably 
I mean, you could look at all the data or you could ask people. One of the things we did um, for a period from 2010 to about 2015 is literally asked people. And uh, we asked uh, uh, engineers, mechanics, uh, uh, organized labor, senior management, government, academia, uh, not only in the U.S., but also um, around the world. What, are, if, if, what do you think are the challenges to, to um, uh, what are the human factors challenges in maintenance and engineering? Now, I could spend a couple hours saying, well, here's what they said in this country, in this country, and now here's what happens when you put it all together. But instead, I have just one slide where we put all the data together, and there was not much variance, whether you're answering the question whether you're in the Gulf or if you're in uh, 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 Europe or North America. Number one, we put two categories together, which was culture and leadership. And I've, as I looked at the program, uh, well, what we've heard already this morning, and, and as you look at the program for the next two days, there's a lot of excellent, potentially excellent presentations on culture and leadership. So, um, and rightfully so, because 24% of the vote uh, out of quite a few people said that's, that's where the, the main challenge is. Secondly, guess what? Follow the procedures, use of technical documentation. Uh, I won't, hope you don't either, but I won't fall asleep on the job this morning, but fatigue is, is third most. Uh, the challenge of voluntary reporting, which definitely contributes to safety management systems. And uh, the last one I put on there was return on investment. But you can see those percentages, and they sort of drop off, and you have a lot of ties for fifth, sixth, seventh through 10. So well, if, if you found out in 2010 to 2015, 16, these were the challenges, wh what did you do about what you do about it, Bill? Well, first of all, we, we ran a number of workshops. I just put four up there. Uh, uh, everything I'm going to talk about is really going to go to this website, humanfactorsinfo.com. Humanfactorsinfo.com. If you type human factors information, you get something. If you type HF info, you get something else. But really, humanfactorsinfo.com, and you get the FAA's government website. Sorry about that. The URL's this long. Uh, but humanfactorsinfo.com will we'll get you to everything I'm going to talk about. So we ran a workshop. First of all, the first one we ran was in 2010 to try to identify what the challenges were for about three days with a lot of people. And then we said, well, gosh, if technical documentation is a problem, is fatigue is a problem, if voluntary reporting is a problem, for two or three years after that, we'd run a workshop on that and uh, come up with some solutions. Those reports are anywhere from 50 to 100 pages long, and they're downloadable off the website. Yeah, with a lot of, here's the problems, here, here, here's how they were defined, here's, what, here's approaches, here's some of the solutions. Um, one of the uh, things we did, if, you know, I said uh, 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 culture was a challenge. Uh, another challenge, of course, was the fatigue area. We created a, a, a web based on the far left, a, a fatigue uh, uh, awareness program that's been used by 150,000 people worldwide. It's a two hour training program that also includes a a movie called Grounded. Uh, if I had all the time in the world, I'd run that movie right now. It's a 19-minute film. It won 18 uh, production awards, including second place at New York Film Festival industrial category on, um, on, on fatigue and a story about a, a maintenance manager who had some ch was challenged with fatigue. Uh, anyway, the, 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 way I f the reason I feel so strongly about the two-hour web-based training that you can, you can access again from our website is um, an extremely high, like 95% of the people that start it, finish it, and take the test, and pass the test. Uh, even, they might have to take tests two or three times, but the, the important thing is, it's one of those web-based training programs where you look at it, and you really don't get it done because it's boring or whatever reason. People are taking it, starting it, and using it, and I think a number of you probably have. A lot of companies have adopted it into their, either into their human factors programs or safety programs, recurrent training, whatever it might be. And then uh, the other thing we did was um, a lot of work on return on investment, and uh, that's the first time I'm really going to use the term uh, and get it down to where it's usable, explainable, understandable, and uh, people could take it from my presentation to their operations quite easily. We put together a book, and I think I brought it with me here, so you wouldn't think it's a big one. Uh, page count equals uh, 53 pages, where you see the check marks where we, we, we dealt with, um, the, again, those challenges, which were uh, hazard identification, oh, which coincidentally, this was a, a, an edited book, and the hazard identification chapter 
uh, and Dr. Rankin is in the audience and speaking about six times over the next couple days. Uh, Bill wrote that chapter with a colleague from, uh, with another colleague from Boeing. Uh, measuring the impact, Johnson. Uh, procedural compliance, uh, training, fatigue risk management, health and safety. So we try to address within this short document, here's the problems, here's the major ways of solving them, and after you do that, it lets you ask the questions to see whether or not you really solve some of those challenges. So, uh, so that's the document, it's downloadable or it's for perks, you could buy it from Aircraft Technical Book Company, but you can also download it. Actually, if you download it and print it on a color printer, I think it costs more if you really looked at the color printer charges than just buying it from that company. Um, we also have a, 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 um, uh, a quarterly newsletter. Now that one does have my picture on it. You want your picture on it? No problem. Send us something, we'll work with you to uh, get you on the front page and we'll put your picture on. Uh, that one, th that one's a recent um, uh, December 2015 where it, uh, I talked there about the new compliance philosophy and its relationship to safety management. And uh, it's very aligned, Mark, it's so aligned with some of the kind of things you were saying. And again, it's, uh, it's you know, we, we make a requirement about 1,500 words or less. So again, you can pick it up, read it pretty quickly. Uh, the, the one that just came out uh, April 1st is, uh, why <coughs> tries to answer the question, why can't government soft be, software be more like social media? And that's on the same website. What's the website? Humanfactorsinfo.com. And that is the website uh, front page. Probably you're in pro you got a problem if you have to use a slide to show your website front page, but so let's change it quickly. All right, so those are the challenges. So SMS to the rescue. I, I know I stand before an audience that doesn't need an S SMS lecture. That you're, uh, as uh, Sean said, you're always trying to do it better. Uh, I just have uh, one slide that made me think, is, does it come to the rescue of some of the challenges they just stated? First of all, it clearly formalizes the data collection to understand where we are and, and where we're headed. Uh, prompts deeper root cause analysis to understand what some of those, what, why are they challenges, what happened that make them uh, fall into the challenges category. And um, identify the hazards. Of course, again, this is preaching to the choir. Um, I believe it really refreshes the, fo a good safety management program will refresh the focus on human factors. Because what, what does it do? It identifies where your hazards are and whether it's a regulation or not to do some specific human factors thing. The, if human factors, which I believe it is, if that bubbles to the top of your um, identified hazards, you're gonna approach it, you're gonna, you have to approach it and do something about it, say how you do it, measure it, promote it. So things like um, human factors uh, or fatigue kind of things. If fatigue is not a problem in your organization, it's not gonna bubble up in a good SMS. If it is a challenge, you're gonna do something about it, whether IASA, FAA, CASA, or whomever makes the regulation or not. So that, that regulation for fatigue or human factors is essentially here, it's called SMS. Uh, allocate new, res because of that, I think that's gonna allocate additional new resources and renewed interest in human factors programs that have been around on the maintenance side since the mid 80s and before that on the pilot side, of course. It's probably even called that. Um, and I believe since we're paying closer attention to data, I think it's gonna give us an opportunity to show how you get better return on the investments you make in safety and in human factors as, uh, yeah, interventions as well. Uh, I, you can't talk to Bill Johnson without getting a little pitch about PEAR. Uh, I'm not giving the hand show how many people know what PEAR stands for, or I can be specific. Uh, I, won't, I won't do it to you from, uh, no I won't. Uh, okay, PEAR and other models. Okay, so whatever works for you. Anyone who's taken some kind of safety class over the years if you're over 30 years old, you probably heard the shell model, and I'm not here to lecture about the shell model. Uh, we all know about the Swiss cheese, Jim Reason's Swiss cheese. Uh, here we are in Vancouver, Gordon DuPont lives down the street in Richmond, uh, the dirty dozen. Again, the words aren't important, the concept. Never seen that one, <laughs> of course. Figuring out the uh, probability of something happening, and they can look at the severity. And of course, we all know that that model. Uh, bow tie. Uh, 
think there was some plan for a bow tie session here. I don't know its status now. Uh, as I look at every, every one of those, I say to myself, you know, whether it's shell or, let's say that those four slices of cheese looked at people that were doing the job and looked at the environment in which they were working in. And the third slice of cheese looked at the actions that they're performing and the fourth slice was uh, the resources necessary to do the job on that slice of cheese. Or what if the bow tie, uh, the proactive things we're gonna look at relate to the person, where they're working, the actions they perform, the resources. Well, this model called PEAR, People, Environment, Action, Resources, I believe works within any of the other models as well. Also, it's pretty easy for um, people to remember, P-E-A-R, it's that simple. I mean, as, as well as we think we know the Dirty Dozen or the Swiss cheese model, it sure is easy to remember four words, people, environment, action, resources, that is on the quiz. Uh, and I guess when we talk about environment, when we're talking that safety culture that, that uh, Sean just spoke about, a lot of that has to do with the environment, the socio-technical environment that people are working in, the leadership, et cetera. Now, we're not gonna do it, but if we wanted to take PEAR and really break it out, we might do this, start with a slide like this that looks at you know, the human, and we look at physical attributes, uh, psychological attributes, psychosocial uh, attri attributes. In fact, if I zoom back in on, um, on uh, culture, uh, I don't, I'm not sure I'd put it on the people side. We could, but I think I'd put it on the environmental side. But anyway, people, environment, action, resources. I'm going to address a lot of issues. I showed a couple of you this. Uh, again, let's talk about Costa Concordia. Uh, it looks at people, not only the people that are doing the job, but the passengers that they serve, the whole system, people, the environment in which they're working, uh, the resources necessary to get the job done, or in this case, to clean up the job that was done. And then you have the captain uh, who, while awaiting his disposition, uh, got a job driving a school bus in the United States. <laughs> By the way, the, uh, the, the people that are laughing were the people that raised their hands first time they ever came to a meeting. Uh, and then, uh, Okay, so Pear, the, the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is the evolved uh, thinking and acting uh, that, we, that we're seeing today from, from government. And I'm pretty, I, you know, sometimes I've only been on government 10 years, but like the rest of you, I've got regulated, regulated by them for some 30, 40, 50, whatever it might be. Um, sometimes I didn't like what they did, and sometimes even as an employee, I wasn't ready to jump up and wave the flag of any country and say, yeah, our government's did all the right things, but some of the things we're doing right now in safety, I'm really proud of what I'm seeing not only in the states, but in all the national aviation authorities. And the, 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 new, uh, the newest term we're using at FAA is the compliance philosophy. I'm gonna, I just gotta take it right out of, by the way, that's FAA order right on the bottom, so if you really wanna get the, the numbers, it's a, it's a pretty short order, uh, easy to read. But our regulator, our, our administrator, uh, we had a, we had a um, video that everyone had to watch um, that was on the compliance philosophy. And he's a really, um, Mr. Herta's really a friendly, nice fella, but man, he put on his game face and got so serious about this compliance philosophy and how important it is to work in, this, in, in the era of, of good safety management and good cooperation with, uh, with, uh, within government and between government and industry. So when, when deviations from regulatory state, I'm gonna read it, uh, do occur, the FAA's goal is to use the most effective means to return an individual or entity to full, there's blah, 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 to full compliance and prevent reoccurrence. Now this is what I like. This isn't the FAA, I, when I was a pilot or a mechanic, we if they were gonna bust me for something. The FAA recognizes that some deviations arise from fract factors like as flawed, flawed procedures, simple mistakes, lack of understanding, uh, diminished skills, and they believe that the uh, deviations of this nature can most effectively uh, be corrected with root cause analysis and training, education, or other appropriate um, improvements um, to procedures. And Mark, I think you, you read something almost exactly like that in, fr from your organization. That's pretty nice language, you know, it's sort of backing up, hey, stuff happens, and let's, 
let's, uh, let's find out a way to address it without getting out the ticket book and seeing if we can take people's license or find them. That's not, he made it clear, that's the last thing we're going to do. The first thing we're going to do is figure out what's going on and work with the um, individual or organization to try to find uh, uh, compliance. I have one more slide with a lot of words on it, but the goal is to identify deviations from standard and correct, and correct them as quickly as, uh, and conveniently as possible. And then instead, do those easy ones, get them all done with just the compliance philosophy and the bad guys who say, screw you, FAA, I'm not gonna cooperate with you, who consistently break the rules, who do, you know, reckless, and so on and so forth. Let's spend the resources going after, after that group. Now, uh, I'm gonna, Oh, geez, I didn't get crane on the backup switch. Yes, I did. It's the one that points backwards. Uh, the, um, you might say, Bill, that stuff sounds nice, but you've got some 5,000 airworthiness and um, uh, airworthiness and operations inspectors, and then, man, they've got the ticket book in their back hand and they're really in their back pocket, and they're really ready to, you know, you know enforce things because that's their job, and if they don't do it, they're going to get busted by their management because they haven't been... Um, um, in, you know, uh, writing the, the, the documents, uh, 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 of enf the serious documents of enforcement. How do you, ch that's a cultural change in and of itself. To suddenly they're going to be Mr. Nice Woman or Mr. Nice Guy. Well, further on in the order it says, accordingly, AFS, which is the flight standards, uh, AFS leaders, managers, and supervisors will support inspectors when they use something you don't see in government very often. Cr critical thinking to, um, well, wait, I should only point the finger at my own government, right? Not, not CASA or, God forbid, Transport Canada with such clear thinking, always. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I was looking for a flag. Uh, to uh, exercise some professional judgment and take actions in accordance with this notice. So the inspector steps up and goes a little, it's not, this is wrong words, goes a little traditionally, goes light on someone, and says, well, let's talk about what happened here. Oh, you forgot? Well, what happened? Well, why? You know what? Let's put something in place that you don't make that same mistake twice. Have a nice day. And if, if a manager thinks that's not the way to solve it, he or she's got some explaining to do. Now, that's a pretty busy slide. Uh, at the time I made it, I thought it made sense. But when I look at it from here, or even from here, <laughs> Um, but on, the, on the, uh, this side, uh, the FAA has their compliance philosophy, and they've got to cooperate with one another and also with others, and you follow their fingers down. Uh, they, that requires that they think critically, that they're consistent. Now, these are pretty big words. Think about it, as you've had uh, associations with sometimes with inspectors. Consistent, just culture, fairness. And they'll, government will do all those things in cooperation with industry, and in industry over on this side, is saying they, they have a, a safety management system that has threat and error management, line operation safety assessment. Uh, by the way, that's not a typo. I know a lot of you use the term line operation safety audit. Well, we start pushing with A4, uh, Airlines for America about eight or nine years ago on the engineering side to really uh, take that word aud audit out of there and we created a checklist based audit uh, LOSA system. We still call it LOSA, uh, but uh, the A stands for assessment as opposed to audit. And then um, put their, you know, their programs together that do risk assessment, has hazard identification, etc. And that makes for a pretty good handshake uh, with the compliance philosophy. Now the other thing I wanted to mention, and I, I know uh, it's um, in, in a number of governments' uh, uh, jurisdictions, but the uh, Aviation Safety Action, ASAP, and I put that near at the end of my presentation, so I know, Bill, as soon as possible, get done. Um, uh, formalized voluntary reporting system. Formalized. Okay, so you know the rules of engagement. It's not anonymous, uh, but usually is without blame. And as Mark said, uh, preceded me talking about, there are no-nos, criminal activity, drugs and alcohol, intentional, fal intentional falsification, reckless conduct, etc. But a panel of labor from any given organization, a panel of labor, FAA, and management get together to decide uh, by established rules what, what would be a, a, a reasonable action based on an error that someone made or even perhaps a violation that someone made. Uh, you combine 
open, voluntary, honest reporting, just culture, compliance philosophy, and all those worlds really do flow together nicely with a strong commitment from both industry and government to make that work. And again, that order on the Aviation Safety Action Program is, uh, I wrote the order down if anyone's you know, taken notes wants to see that. Uh, I put this slide up because this was how many a aviation safety action programs we have in place um, in, in, the, in North America as of uh, December 2015. So 430 programs, and that's, as you can see from the slide, that's uh, not just maintenance groups, but uh, cabin crew, ramp, et cetera. Pilots and, uh, and engineers make up the majority of those that have ASAP programs. And the, uh, there's a quarterly, excuse me, I think it's three times a year, um, uh, uh, ASAP information sharing meeting that goes on with a room about this size and it's uh, I've described it in an article once where in the southern US you have tent revivals where they preach the Bible and uh, people stand up and commit confess their sins and other people out holler out hallelujah or amen brother and in a way the ASAP meeting is like that where people do talk about mistakes that were made and how they dealt with it and you know you don't get up and sing songs or anything they probably do. I've never been to a church tent revival, but I'd like to go to one someday. Last thing, return on investment. Now, I'm going to talk about this at length uh, over the next couple of days. And uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Duncan, safety and finance are number one. Safety and finance are number one. You can't separate them. Now, there's a quote around it implying that somebody important said it. But actually, I was going to put in the real small font. I sort of said that, but I just didn't want to. Um, what are some of the challenges? I go in great, I only have one slide here to talk about a couple of challenges. I think you'll agree with them, and I have more to talk about again tomorrow. Well, you might say it's intangible. You can count some things, but to a certain extent, safety is sometimes difficult to get your hands around. And, and, and I agree with um, uh, Sean, a lot of the things you, you were saying about you don't just measure safety by counting how many bad things that went wrong. Um, cause and effect, <laughs> and Sean mentioned this too, if I did this, well then I'm safe. Well yeah, but here's the, problem. Here's the challenge. I'll do this, oh yeah, by the way, we also did this, 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 and this. In fact, Dr. Rankin and I were in an audience about, I, I don't know where Bill is in, in the audience, but remember when we were sitting in a, a, a conference, a, a large uh, convention like this, and people were, the speaker said, yeah, we did this. We put this program in place at Continental Airlines at, at, at LAX. The following year, there, were only, there was only one lost time job injury because of the program we put in place. And Rankin nudges me, and he says, Bill, you said... Bill, didn't they close LAX like shortly after they put the program in place? <laughs> so sometimes cause and effect is a challenge. Uh, and again, uh, the challenge is the integration and combination. So you seldom can do just one thing. What if you did this and it worked so well that it also had an effect on the cultural change, uh, it, uh, voluntary reporting got better and better, and you know, how can you attribute it that you, you, know, you painted the walls white and at the end of the year this happened? So th that, of course, is a challenge. And then time. It's difficult to say, I did this, and within six months this happened. Because sometimes you steer the ship now, and it could be uh, two years before you really start getting in a situation where you can measure the impact of, the, of that and, and put the values on it and uh, look at the return on investment. Why is it important now? Because we're paying more, we continue to pay more and more attention to safety data. And I, I think if we get better at it, we can start putting better numbers when we have some negative event or even better numbers when we have positive events and we can start assigning values. And those values would be safety measures. We'll have to get Mark back up here and tell us what those would be. Uh, uh, I mean, Sean. Um, and uh, things like voluntary reporting is helping. And again, I think people are just starting to accept it more, not just, in many cases, you management, but uh, the workforce as well. So I'm gonna talk about that simple formula and uh, try to get my PhD book out and get a bunch more complicated words and throw them at you if you'll come to my 90-minute session tomorrow. Uh, and maybe we could get that thing figured out. Or better yet, why don't we just say that uh, return on investment is you take the uh, net returns and subtract what you invested and divide it by investment, let your two-year-old child do the math, and you come out with an ROI. 
if only it were that simple. Uh, and I'm going to get in details tomorrow to show you how this uh, company did just a very few things. It, we feel that it was measurable, the things that happened, and they got about a 312% return within a year, which if we all could do that, our, uh, whatever our retirement programs are, would start to grow pretty quickly. Okay, so what do we do? We talk about the challenges. We suggested the SMS and the timing is right to get a lot of things done. Uh, offered pair as a way to think about human factors. Um, and bragged a little bit about how regulators are thinking about compliance these days, and hopefully talk a few of you into coming to uh, hear more about uh, return on investment. So again, thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here and be in uh, British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So Bill's going to uh, stay up on the, uh, the stage. I'm going to ask Sean now to, uh, to rejoin us up on the other uh, stage. We'll get the, um, the text number put back up on the, uh, the visual, if we could, please, as well, um, just as a reminder. Um, I've got uh, one more introduction to do, and that's uh, Dr. Scott Chappelle. For the 50% that have been here before, you, uh, Scott is well known to you. Others that haven't been here uh, may also know Scott's work, um, uh, as he is extensively uh, well known across the, uh, the industry. Uh, currently professor and, and chair of the Department of Human Factors and Systems at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Uh, before joining them back in uh, 2012, he was professor of Inge industrial engineering at Clemson University uh, for around seven years. And prior to that, he was the human factors research branch manager at the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute. Uh, on top of all that, he served uh, 20 years, uh, of which 11 was active duty in the US Navy as an aerospace experimental psychologist. Uh, he's published many, many uh, um, books and, uh, and articles, over 200 papers, presentations in the field of accident investigations. He's got system, savi uh, sa system safety, rather, behavioral stresses, sustained operations, and fatigue. They're all areas that he, he covers. Um, aviation is his passion, uh, as well as his background. But like Sean, um, the, the principles that he's applied uh, in this area has also now been applied in petrochemicals, forensic science, mining, and increasingly in the world of medicine. Scott's gonna come on, uh, close me down, and start up the facilitation of the, uh, the Q&A session. We've got about 45 minutes uh, for the Q&A, based largely on the, uh, the two presentations, for which, again, thank you both. Uh, but it's over to you via the text, Scott. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, listen, I'm on my second monster, so if I blow an aneurysm up here, you'll know why. And uh, hey, can we do one thing real quick? Can you guys put the original slide up that has the, um, the says what we're doing here the, uh, with the people on there? I just want to point something out. You know, the slide that says this is the session and who are the people and who the facilitator is. You guys have that? I know this is really hitting you hard. Because it's a really important. No, that would not, but that's, that's important too. <laughs> that's really important. All right. There it is. I just want to point out that um, thank you, Duncan and CHC, for making my name so big. <laughs> and my wife said it barely fits my ego, so now you can put the, put the uh, number back up well, there. That's, uh, that's funny, Scott, that you're saying that, because when I saw that slide, I figured you made that slide. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I have a bunch of questions. I've been writing like a wild man, plus I'm waiting to see yours as well. But I wanted to open up, actually, to both of you. Actually, now I've got to find my list here. See what happens when you've had too many Red Bulls. Um, I thought it was interesting, Sean, and particularly when you were talking about metrics and things, and I wanted to open it up to both of you guys, because I think, I find it interesting that if we don't use injuries, accidents, or incidents as metrics of safety as an outcome or some way of measuring against things, what do we propose? What do you propose we actually use in the future to look at safety and culture and those sorts of things? How would you go about that? Can you go on? Please. So the common, I feel like this chair is really low. It is. It's like a <laughs> kid at the big, big guy's table here. So the, the common measurements that organizations are kind of evolving towards now, and many of you probably already do this, is what are the beliefs in the organization? Now the fallacy is let's go measure the beliefs. What tends to happen 
without going on a rant here, what tends to happen is when you measure your existing culture, your strategy becomes a gap closing exercise against a gap that you haven't really defined. And this is why we've encouraged organizations to first define what you want and then measure where you're at against that rather than saying, what are the, what are the beliefs that exist today? Because you may work on changing beliefs that may add no real value to where you're trying to go as an organization. So the things that people are measuring now is defining strategically what beliefs of common in our company would help us advance then measure that. So that's, you're probably already doing perception surveys to some degree, but define the ones that are important to you and measure against that. Knowledge levels, that's what we call the, the safety IQ. Another ROI is return on attention, ROA. If you have a safety meeting, for example, and you discuss PEAR, the four most important things, and a month later you ask people what PEAR stands for and they can only remember two, you have a 50% return on attention. And that starts to look at, if we're doing things, is it sticky? So return on attention, that's one way to measure knowledge levels. But also decisions. You already measure decisions when you're doing an incident investigation. Why did people make those decisions? You could also do it proactively. Are people making the decisions that you want them to make? Storytelling. I have an organization in the pulp and paper industry affecting the mindset of the employees during the onboarding process is critical to protect against the, well, let me show you how it's really done around here, thing that they may experience. So one of the things this one company does, I'll go ahead and say them, it's Domtar. At one of the Domtar sites, they've started measuring how many employee onboarding sessions did we have where another employee set in and told them some safety stories. And they're actually measuring that. But the common things from a cultural perspective, at least, people are measuring, do people believe what we need them to believe? Do they know what we need them to know? Are they doing what we need them to do or able to do competencies? And then also, what's the storytelling? Uh, there's some company, Brown Foreman, for example, they own Jack Daniels and a lot of other liqueurs. One of the things that they measure, they have something that they call uh, a show me report. So they'll go out and assess against the policies and the standards, and they'll take somebody and say, show me how to de-energize that piece of equipment and lock it out and tag it out. And that's kind of demonstrating competencies. That show me data is so much more beneficial to the organization than they know the policies and procedures, but they can't demonstrate it. So those are some high level ones. A lot of companies are also looking at your cycle time of your safety work orders versus your production related types of work orders, what's the average days open. There's a lot of different things that you can look at, and I think what's a meaningful metric for one organization may be pointless for the other. So the challenge is finding the measurements that, again, tell you how you did and how to get better. I guess, I guess uh, well, I, was, I look at something that's pretty easy to count. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many of those are more sophisticated, mm -hmm. but uh, I would measure a culture by the, the increasing number of participants in aviation safety action programs and voluntary reports, where it's not necessarily bad news, it could be good news, usually it's bad news or mistakes, but uh, participation in event reporting I think it would be a good measure of um, safety culture. Well, it, it's that changes upward. Because one of the things that I found, at least in my years of accident investigation, is a lot of times people are safe when they're at work or being watched. It's the question of when do they practice safe behaviors when they're not being watched. A classic example is hand washing. And no offense, uh, but ladies, you probably should know that many guys don't wash their hands when they go to the bathroom. And, um, but we were very tribal in that, in the sense that if we watch somebody else or someone else is in the bathroom, yeah, I'm gonna wash my hands because I don't wanna look like a cretin. And, and so you start, a, you start a little cascade of events. So at the break, there'll be a lot of guys in there, so we'll all have clean hands. My question is, yeah, I know, if you're on your own, it's a different story. Yeah, I know. Where's this going, Scott? More than you wanted to know. <laughs> Um, but I guess the question is, how do you ensure or how do you measure that? Is there a way to know when people are be behaving safely when they're not being watched or there hasn't been an incident or accident? How do you, how do you capture that? Well, the, the, to, to me, that's one of the challenges of really getting a measurement of common practice. The only way you could do that is through cameras and, and those types of things, which doesn't necessarily create the culture you want either. The big brother, uh, <coughs> excuse me, type of approach. You know, what a lot of organizations do is they, they rather measure the capability. Can people do the things we don't want them to do and are they? When you take a sampling of, of common practice. But again, it's common practice that people know that they're being observed. 
But the goal isn't, when we try to advance, the goal isn't to create more gotcha types of processes, right. which I know that's not what you mean, but the goal is to see, can people do the things that we want them to do? Most of the time we find when somebody gets injured, they meant to be doing what they were doing, they just didn't mean for it to turn out that way. So are we measuring if they're able to, to demonstrate the capability of being safe? And then look at, well, what are the things that might influence somebody? That allows us to tease out the influences that might be hidden that we may not see until after an incident uh, happens. But I think a, a lot of it is, as I'm sure you all hopefully would agree, you can visit different companies and you can see or feel something different in the different operations. You can feel that something's different there. And, and that's one of the challenges, trying to find some of those imprecise measurements that give you a sense of real understanding. To me, one last thing is, when you look at what measurement is supposed to do, measurement is supposed to prompt, direct, align, and motivate behavior. The measurements we have today, how many employees are super motivated by the measurements? Why not? <laughs> it's, it's usually because we measure all the things we don't want rather than measuring the things that we want. In North Carolina and Georgia, I saw this recently, they have different counties where they are tracking the sampling of common practice of seatbelt usage. I've been to all 50 states down in, in the US and all states have something that says click it or ticket, $240 fine. In these two states, I've seen signs that will say seatbelt use. Last month, 89% record, 95%. And what I found is that they had anonymous observations where people didn't know they were being observed sitting at intersections with clickers, wearing seatbelt, not wearing seatbelt, and they posted the score. Now they could have said 11% of you knuckleheads weren't wearing the seatbelt and tickets in the mail. Instead, they were doing a sampling of the people that are doing the right thing. So there are ways you could do what we call a sweep observation, seeing without explaining to every person, where you're essentially identifying what you see in common practice. It's not gonna be a precise measurement, but it gives you a better indicator of where you're at. And again, I'm gonna go back to the same answer I gave you before, because if you look at the uh, NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System, uh, ASRS, Aviation Safety Reporting System. Uh, I've read a lot of those to try to understand fatigue, understand why people chose, uh, didn't use documentation. And a lot of times, well, they don't write them when they're necessarily doing the right thing, but a lot of times they're writing them when if they didn't write that, no one would have even known about it. So uh, that's a, maybe a bit of a measure of whether people are doing the right thing from a cultural standpoint. Yeah, you know, I, I think when I look at it, I look at, like for example, if I go back to my parents, my parents never wore a seatbelt. If you think back to the 50s and 60s, you shoved the seat belts underneath the cushions. You just never did. But there's a culture now. There's been a cultural change. My kids will never go anywhere without a seatbelt on. They've had seatbelts on their whole lives. And I think that's the challenge sometimes is trying to get the culture. And in safety, it's always been a challenge. I don't know what the answer is, and I don't know if maybe you do. But how do you get people to think as safe, safety all the time? And because I go home and I can tell you, I do some of the craziest things. When I walk, when I drive out the gate, my safety hat goes flying off the, uh, off the, off, out of the car. And I just don't know how to do that. And, and somehow we haven't reached that point. I, I know that um, Duncan wrote a note here, you know, when we talk about compliance, maybe compliance is an outdated word. Maybe it's more conformance or something else. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, when you, threw the, when you threw Duncan's compliance word in there, uh, <laughs> threw me for a curve, because I, I was gonna, resp I wanted to get back to that mm -hmm. uh, seatbelt example that you gave us, if I may. Um, uh, United has been one of the leaders in the uh, ground operations, line operation safety assessment. And prior to that, Continental brought a lot of that to United. And uh, what they would do is they would train workers who volunteered to, to be observers in LOSA to conduct these LOSA observations. And a, a lot, and they, so a lot of people got their turn to be the note taker LOSA uh, observer. And what their comments were to us, back to us was, after I quit doing the LOSA assessment, I found myself, even though they don't necessarily give feedback during the assessment, they found themselves watching one another uh, and, and giving peer to peer input to one another more so than they did prior to using the LOSA. So in, in a way, you know, one approach to getting people to do the right thing is getting peer-to-peer -peer pressure, right. you, know, a, you know, a norm, a good norm. The idea of eliminating the word compliance. You know, I never thought about that, but uh, 
I was thinking about it from the context of, I showed you that there's rules of engagement, there's 400 some companies using ASAP. Well, why couldn't ASAP just sort of become automatic where you don't necessarily have to have all these memorandums of agreement and right. it just becomes a normal way of doing business? And then it isn't complying with anything, it's just doing the right thing. Uh, I'm not ready to agree that we should get rid of it yet, though. We have to find, <laughs> a, we have to find the, uh, the right, better word because you know there is compliance, and you know there are sort of a uh, a set of good operating practices that tend to turn into rules, and sort of we all expect from one another that we comply to offer the industry some level of uh, safe operation. So I think rather than change the word, let's look at the word as a positive thing, not a negative thing. I feel I owe you some money because we were actually the consultancy that helped Continental put that in place many years ago. Oh, were so, you? So thank you for that. All right. Uh, you know, and one of the things that With they no did, money. one of the things that they did, which was what I think the answer, the partial answer to that, is defining what people need to do to be safe. Uh, something that, an example that really hit me, hit home for me, about 10 years ago, I was working with a company headquartered in Burbank, California, and the executive vice president that was leading this effort for the organization, which the right person for the job, not the safety department, but the head of ops. He got up a few weeks after we started working with him and had to use the restroom in the middle of the night. His wife said that as he left his bedside, he must not have seen the magazine on his carpeted bedroom floor. His wife said that when he slipped on that magazine and he hit his head, he blurted out a few choice phrases, but he went to the restroom and went back to sleep not realizing he was internally hemorrhaging. He died that night. You know, when we talk about safety, safety to a lot of people is an outcome or it's compliance. We have to define what people need to do to be safe. That's how you start to get that engagement. You know, if, if you land in Newark, New Jersey and head south on the turnpike, you'll see a Sitco tank farm. And this was actually in the opening credits of the show Sopranos. It was on HBO years ago. It says, drive safely. My oldest daughter is 18 years old and she's a driver now. But how many of you put your kids behind the vehicle for the first time and said, drive safely? <laughs> probably not. You probably told them what driving safely meant. You gave them feedback when they were doing it. You gave them feedback when they weren't. Safety has to be defined to people by what we have to do to have the injury-free outcome. But if we want people to be engaged in it, they have to see, to your point, how portable it is. It's not just what we do here. Everything we do to protect this room stays in the room when we leave. What's the mindset that we're giving with people? Because in Canada and the United States, I know the numbers for that at least, you're 10 to 11 times more likely to get injured outside of work than at work. Right. And if people get injured outside of work, they're still gonna be just as absent as if they got injured on the job. So it's business necessity and, and altruistic. But I think a lot of it has to do with being specific about what it means to be safe in an operation rather than just obeying all the rules, follow all the procedures, wear all your PPE, and you won't get injured. We know that's but, not but, the case. But those are, those are a good start. Yeah, you, know, you have to start there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, it's, there's a question from the audience that I'm going to actually, whoop, it was there. Uh, I don't know where it went. Oh, here we go. Um, nope. Well, I will well, basically I ask you, they, they've kind of moved there. around, they're adding, there's a whole bunch of them there, but I really wanted to get at this, I, I was intrigued, Bill, when you were up here, and, and as a former FAA guy, I, like you, I wore a white hat. I didn't, I didn't get issued the black hat, like you didn't get one either. You got a white hat. I'm still working you. on it. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I, look, I look good in a black hat, but how do you reconcile that order? FAA 8000, order 8000, what is it, 8000.373. Is this the compliance and, policy? And this whole idea of compliance and that we're now the kind, it sounded like we were kinder, gentler FAA, when in fact the view is it's very black hat. And how do you reconcile that? Because the impression is regulation, most people don't like to be regulated. I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of being regulated. All right. Um, but how do you reconcile that you know, now we're the kinder, gentler, it appears, as you were saying. Yeah, that's what it appears to me when I see it. I, I guess, I, well, I came to FAA 10 years ago. Right. And uh, a lot of things have happened down in the Southwest region. Gosh, I, I feel like this is probably a Bill Johnson answer than an FAA answer, but I don't think you can separate the two. But I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, there were, um, there were a number of issues to do with uh, whether or not an airworthiness directive was being followed on a, uh, I think both Southwest and American 737s and uh, had to do with tie wraps around a cable bundle that went through the, um, somebody could probably help me on that better, but 
The question was whether or not those companies had complied to that exactly to that AD chapter and verse. And the inspectors that initially looked at it, as I recall the as I recall the story, was that they uh, they felt that okay, so maybe it was supposed to be spaced uh, an inch, and somebody was spaced, spaced an inch and an eighth, and therefore they weren't complying with an airworthiness directive, which means that airplane is not allowed to fly legally. So someone decides, well, if they're not complying. Uh, you know, it, it's really not that bad. I mean, it's not gonna really affect the safety of, of flight. Someone that was looking at it from a, uh, uh, a technical perspective, let it slide. Well, and so did some of his colleagues, and so did some of the managers. By let it slide might be the wrong word. They advised the company that they needed to get that straightened out. For gosh sakes, you don't need to ground your fleet because of spacing of tie rats, when probably an inch and a quarter was probably for all practical purposes, the same as an inch. Well, a bunch of heads rolled because they didn't comply right. verbatim with the, with the airworthiness directive and, it, and the inspectors got in, and their managers got in big trouble, as I recall the story. So what happened then is inspectors then said, I always have to go exactly by the rule. There's no asking questions, there's no assessing the the, the risk uh, that a quarter of an inch on tie spacings would make any difference. And as a result, the inspector workforce was told, go by the book and issue the direct, issue right. wh whatever compliance action needs to be taken, but issue one. And now we're saying, well, let's have a compliance philosophy that really looks at the situation and assesses <laughs> risk. And, uh, finds, uh, asks the right questions in a reasonable, and fair, um, repeatable way. That caused me to say that seems like it's kinder, kinder, gentler, and more reasonable. It's more enlightened way of doing business. And I'm, I'm looking at a question that I don't think the audience sees that says, well, why is it new, Bill? You keep calling it the new compliance philosophy. I think I sort of just answered that question no, as well. Did. It's new because inspectors now are, are becoming empowered once again and trained, by the way. It's not say, all right, now just go be a nicer guy or a nicer <clears throat> woman. They're being trained to make better decisions, um, uh, uh, training to do root cause analysis, training to communicate better. And uh, those are all pluses. And, Sometimes we didn't see all of that in some of our inspectors. And the, one of the things I, I noticed uh, uh, was I, te I teach a human factors course for the um, Department of Transportation, but we deliver it to all FAA and uh, airworthiness inspectors. And when this compliance philosophy first came out, which was back in last uh, June or July, the first few classes, they were just culturally just well there's no right. way I'm going to do that because the first guy I let slide you're going to get burned I'm going to be in trouble yeah. and I continue to teach the class and now they all have the word uh, the compliance philosophy in their vocabulary and I see them talk with one another about it and suddenly they're the disciples of that concept and, and that's in a what a nine month time frame since it came out the culture of our I, I believe our inspector workforce is changing in a very positive, enlightened way, and I'm happy to say that. I'm proud I, of it. I, and to change the topic just a hair, Sean, I, I, I was intrigued by your talk. I was sitting down there, I've got pages of notes, and first thing I'm gonna do, I wrote a note, get all three books, so I'm gonna get your books. Oh, you some money too, at the <laughs> I would encourage people to do that, but here's my problem. We deal with a world of engineers, pilots, mechanics, people that are very quantitative and aren't, frankly, very touchy-feely. And when you start using terms like caring, and I, I wrote down a list of you know fairness, compassion, blah, blah, blah. They, their eyes glaze over and they're like, okay, no. How do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? How do you get engineers? In fact, one of the questions was, I think it's in there somewhere. How do you get, now it's moved. There we go, thank you guys, they're highlighting it for the old guy. How do we drive personal accountability and ethics and decision by frontline engineers? How do you get that done in this very much more quantitative world without emotion? For a long time, we're trying to answer what I hear you saying is, you know, how do we answer the what's in it for me question? You know, how do we, how do we show value to those individuals? 
there's, a, there's something in sales that's called an elevator pitch. And it's kind of a silly thing, but if you find yourself in an elevator, it comes from the early days of Hollywood screenwriter, find yourself in an elevator, you know, what's your short sentence where somebody says, that's interesting, tell me more. So somebody's asking, why are we doing this? Why do we need to go in this direction in safety? What's the value add answer? And if you haven't thought about this before, then it's gonna sound, it's gonna sound artificial. Now I'm not saying necessarily you wanna script your answers, but what I've seen work really well in an organization is map out five different areas and have a conversation with people in your organization. If we're excellent in safety, here's the five areas, how does it drive value? What's the benefit to the employees? What's the benefit to the employee's family? What's the benefit to you as a leader? What's the benefit to your department or site? What's the benefit to overall the overall company? And if you don't have a range of answers for that, then you're not talking to the individual about what they value. But yes, it is a bit touchy-feely, if you will, but it's that old saying, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're always gonna get what you've always got. I, I think a lot of that comes from changing the language, changing the terminology, and changing the focus. You know, a government agency is changing to a more compassionate type of approach. In business, we learn that. It's the difference between a cop and a coach. You know, policing things are important. If you have uniform deviation from a rule, then martial law is needed, not cajoling. But if we want to try to move that leadership style, it has to start, like a lot of things, at the top of the organization. If I'm working with an organization, a public utility right now, who I was with last week, and they're trying to do something that's called Smith Driving System. It's a training about how to drive safely. And several of the executives thought it was a waste of time until the CEO went through it. Because the CEO went through it and started using some language around it. Interestingly, several of the executives started to volunteer to go to this training. You know, people pay attention to what the boss pays attention to. And if we wanna change the culture, to your point, it, it takes a long time to change a culture that's been established but it has to start at the top of the organization and yeah. changing some of the language, changing the terms that we use. It's not a quick process, but in nine months you've seen a, you know, a change. Yeah. It has to start at that level, I believe. Uh, you just used a word that I think I incorrectly used uh, about compassionate. And maybe that's not the, that's not the right way to describe the compliance philosophy. If, if I use that, probably logic-based and reasonable would trump compassion. I feel sorry for you, let me let you go. Yeah, yeah that's That doesn't point. cut it. I understand what happened. I, I assessed the risk with you together. We did a root cause analysis. We, knows what's, we know what's causing the problem. You haven't been doing it all the time. You're agreeing to cooperate. Let's, let's just figure out how to get this done and heck with the paperwork. But by the way, inspectors do have to document what they're doing about things, but not on a form that's uh, yeah, I think one of the things, and actually there's action. a question along these lines, is I hear thrown, I've heard for the last, oh, maybe five or six years, this term, just culture thrown around. Everybody throws around, as, and it's almost become a politically correct term. We all, and we all kind of aspire, oh yeah, well we have a very just culture. That means different things to different people. And one of the questions that we had here is, how do you grow safety reporting initiatives when not everyone in the organization understands or even believes in a just culture. They may say the words, but they're not really believing it. And in the best interest of American politics and political correctness, how do you reconcile that? Can, can, I, can I just have a short shot at it? Absolutely. You got a just culture? Can I see it? Can I see the paragraph that shows me your just culture? <laughs> and that would be the first question I would wanna ask because is it written down? Do people understand it? And, and then, then let's talk about, oh, you have a just culture, yeah. It's, no, you know, we, we don't do anything if people report errors. Oh, yeah? You know, tell me the rules of engagement, right? I mean, go ahead. I, I think respectfully in a lot of situations it becomes a buzzword that everybody wants without really looking at, well, what are we trying to accomplish with this? And, and identifying, well, what are we currently doing that's motivating it? What are we currently doing that's demotivating it? Don't let it become a buzzword. What's, what's the value you're trying to get out of having a just culture? You know, and again, that's, if we want certain things to exist, we have to have the conversation about why we currently don't. You know, I like to joke that most people wake up motivated, they come to work and it gets beaten out of them throughout the day. So we need to stop demotivating people. But when you look at desirable performance that you want, there's really a three-step process that they teach. Number one, you have to identify and neutralize the demotivators. Number two, then you add motivators in. And then number three, you reward the people 
for going above and beyond just what you looked at. But I think a broader issue is if you want a certain type of culture, you know, why aren't you currently having it and address those things? I, I find there's five reasons why you're typically not getting the level of performance that you want. Number one, some people, hopefully a very small percentage, are just unwilling to do what you need them to do. That's when you have to sometimes make those deselection decisions. It, hopefully it's very few and small, far between. Number two is some people are just unable. So they're not doing what you need them to do around that because they don't know how, they don't have the skills. A lot of people get into leadership positions without ever being taught how to be an effective leader. Number three, they're unaware. We've never really ex expressed to them what's expected of them. They can't re re uh, recite it back to us what we expect of them. Number four is they're unaccountable. We're not holding people accountable for the performance. We hold people accountable for the results, but it typically sounds like we didn't get the results we wanted who needs to be held accountable. There's a term that's called proactive accountability. We hold people accountable for the performance. And then number five, it's unlike the culture. And that's where it's gonna take a lot longer. But if you look at, you want to just culture, is that a buzzword you want? Or is there certain aspects of that you want to in integrate into your organization? If you want to integrate that into your organization, rather than jumping off on initiatives and incentivizing behavior, try to figure out why you're not getting it. I, I see in reporting, a lot of times they incentivize near miss reporting, which creates a fiction writing contest. Right rather than, well, why aren't we getting it in the first place? Let's address those reasons. And a lot of it, to the point I've heard before, has to do with terminology. How it's defined is all over the place. So it's no wonder we have the undesirable performance. Oh, no, I, I would agree. I think, I mean, I look over, I'm reading some of these down here. I think that, um, you know, I guess one of my questions is, there is always this, this conflict between operations and safety. And then we put, we wrap that, with this idea of culture and just culture. And I heard both of you in your talks kind of address it a little bit and how do we get there from here? And where does it start? I mean, do we start, we, do we start the changes at the top? Are they at the pointy end of the spear? How do you get there? If you're in an organization that basically is still working in the 50s, how do you bring them into, into our century? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific MRO that um, is really on the just culture, uh, safe, well, on the safety culture bandwagon. Right. And they, uh, they were, they, this company acquired an MRO that you refer to as out of the 50s. Did, did you use that term? I mean, they yeah. had a culture out of the 50s and they brought in a number of good safety culture oriented senior management and who really worked closely, is currently working very closely with the chief executive who doesn't claim to know what to do, but knows he wants it done and he wants to change this old organization into thinking uh, safely, or thinking safety, or at least inculcating some kind of safety culture. And uh, so they're doing it by educating at the top I think it's got to come from top and bottom both. It, it is, and unfortunately, the middle level, lower level leaders get squeezed out by the top down and the bottom up initiatives, and sometimes they're left out. The middle guys? Seen, the middle guys, yeah. 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 And, and I've seen companies that they've approached us, because we do a lot of stuff in that space, and say, we want to train our supervisors. Well, are, is their boss getting it? Are their boss's boss getting it? All training is only as effective as the reinforcement that follows. And if you give that level, but th that's where I think a lot of it is. But I think we have to step back and if this, if leadership improvement is viewed as a safety exercise, it's a safety exercise. It has to be viewed as a business exercise. This is where the safety strategy has to be a part of the business strategy. And if the safety strategy is not a part of the business strategy, just like Drucker pointed out, culture eats strategy for breakfast. My follow up is that the business strategy will eat the safety strategy all day long. The safety strategy has to enable and protect the business strategy, not try to compete against it. And a lot of times in safety improvement efforts, especially with leaders and employees, that they view that as another exercise and then they go back to work. When you look at a, a great leader in safety, it's somebody who communicates well, it's somebody who coaches, et cetera, et cetera. That's just leadership. And I think that's the problem in, in some situations is that this is viewed as a separate exercise we have to do rather than this is what we want from our leaders to begin with. We want these types of employees in the organization. Are we hiring for that type of employee? Are we enabling that type of employee? It's not just the safety. 
thing. Now, certainly there's some activities that are safety specific, but when you start looking at culture, the, the safety strategy has to be a part of the business strategy, and that means the business leaders need to be a part of the development. When we safety leaders go away and create the safety strategy, it will conflict at some point with the business strategy if it's not considered during, during the design phase. What, what's uh, interesting, I'm getting, oh, go, go ahead, Bill. Well, um, my comment was, I'm not sure that the safety that the business strategy is going to beat the safety strategy all day long, all the time, forever. Because ultimately, you have the loss, and suddenly you start talking safety again. But, but when you look, I, I agree with you. But when it's sustainable value that we're looking for, then it's we've had an incident, and we react. The medical, I, I know you work in that space. Uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant, who's one of the physicians that helped eradicate smallpox, one of his mantras he came up with was early detection, early response. You know, if we can detect things early enough, we can respond rather than having to react, which is a negative thing in medicine. And I think that the companies that do well allow the business strategy and safety strategy to have those early detection mechanisms rather than, of course, the safety, you know, does take precedence when there's an incident, but it's the early detection to where we can respond, I think, where we win in safety. And I also think if, if we worked a little harder to put um, uh, return financial return on our safety initiatives and start demonstrating those one step at a time before you know it it's capable of trumping business strategy because it you know I, I think and also I would um, one of the things I've I've mentioned to many people I've been at several safety conferences this being one of my favorites by far um, and, and it, it indicates that there's a culture within CHC of safety just by virtue of the fact that if you've looked at the history of this conference you'll see that but I also go down, usually, well, I've been there the last couple years, Qantas has a safety conference. And what's interesting to me is it's kicked off by Alan Joyce, the president, and he sits in every session. He sat in the front row of my talks. And, and, these, and so he doesn't just come and then leave, as I've seen in several, I've been in many conferences where the, you know, I'll give a talk at a big organization, and then the boss comes in and says, this is the most important day of, of our company, and he's gone, because something's more important. And I understand it, the business is business. But I think there's a question down here that I, I think kind of marries up with that a little bit. It says, is there value in the formal reward system for good compliance within the rules? How do, how do you, as management, reward compliance? Or do we even want to? How do you motivate it? Because somebody, people don't act without motivation. You have to be motivated to do something. How do you go about, that's a tough nut to crack. We try and crack it with our kids all the time. How do we motivate them to do the right thing when they're not in our view? How do I make sure my daughter is doing the right things or my son is doing the right things? How are you going to do that? What would you recommend? Well, you get a first shot at that one. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, rewards and all of that's a very slippery slope. I, I, I've seen some of the brightest individuals make a mess of things with trying to reward certain things. You know, from a, from a safety perspective in OSHA down in the States, they're really going after organizations that are rewarding based on incident rates because we know that can drive under reporting. I think from a, from a higher level, long-term thinking, anytime you reward expected behavior, you're replacing the intrinsic motivation to do it for the extrinsic motivation. I think ideally compliance is something that's expected of an organization, but you reward those that go above and beyond that. Um, I'm comfortable with your answer. You're, you're good not, with that one? I, no, I can't add value to that. <laughs> okay, well, let me give you something in your wheelhouse then. Because you talked about... This not the question on PMA I see there. No, I'm not going to get to <laughs> that. that. I don't know if I'll get to that one yet or not. But I, your return on, on investment, and it's, it's interesting because my mentor, Peter Gardner, rest his soul, was... He gave... I remember about eight, nine years ago, he gave a lecture here in, in one of the opening addresses and where he talked about the cost benefit of safety and how to make a business case for safety. And similar to what you were talking about with return on investment, mm -hmm. and I saw your last diagram, and I do think it would be worth because you can see how that's computed. How do you make a business case for that? And I guess the question I have is, how do we, how do we get, are we gonna turn all of our middle managers into accountants now? Are we gonna turn the people that are at the foreman, and not, I'm not talking about the people at the very top, about the people that actually have to enact your safety programs do we now turn them into accountants how do we do this well you, you my way of doing it first of all no you don't have to turn them into accountants my way of doing it is it, it seems like um, the better someone understands something 
the, the easier it is for them to explain it and to empower you to go to the next step. So um, I don't want to say I'm an expert on ROI, but I've been trying to make it simple enough that I understand it for about the last 20 years. I have conference papers from 20 years ago where I talked about return on investment. People probably thought I was crazy. And people are saying, hey, would you come and talk on return on investment now? Which is, uh, things have evolved, but uh, you know, KISS. Keep it, it was, uh, keep I heard it the simple. acronym, don't tell me. It was keep it, <laughs> it was keep it, uh, it wasn't, it was a new acronym. It was more polite than keep it simple, stupid. It was Silly. It was, make it so people can understand it for gosh sakes, and they can remember it and they can apply it. And what I'm going to tell you tomorrow is, I'll tell you what, do, take the most elementary thing that you want to do and try to put some simple numbers on it, and you can. Uh, estimate what it's really going to cost to get that accomplished over what time frame. And go through that drill once or twice with a formula or without one. See if it works for you. And, and before you know it, I, 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 people start believing you. I compare it to your, I have a granddaughter who lives in Vancouver, by the way, and we were walking behind her with the bicycle. And she, you know, she's two and a half and she can just go with the, one of those little scooter bicycles. Well, I can already see what's happening. She goes farther every time. And you start trusting her because she went a little bit, she made it, let her go farther every time. And I, I'm sure by the time I come back, I hope I come back sooner than this, but before long, she's gonna be on the two wheel pedaling it and when she goes all the way around the back, she's gonna ask for the car keys. Because, and they'll give them to her because they trusted her every step along the way. She proved she can do it. She showed the safety return. She came back uninjured, although you said that's not necessarily a measure of safety. <laughs> Good point. And I agree with you. It's uh, an important one, though. So, uh, but, and I've run the, the simple ideas that I've put together by economists. Uh, and they said, yeah, you're right, Bill, but you know, you didn't do the time value money, you didn't do that complicated formula with all the summations, et cetera. I said, well, we sorta of did. And they said, yeah, you sorta of did, but you didn't have all the details. Well, if we got it, like, I'm not saying turn the middle manager into the economist, but for gosh sakes, you could actually turn av aviation engineers to, into thinking about, you know, if we did this, we could save this and save this. And suddenly you do them a few times and it's not complicated. And I really found myself when we were doing a lot of research in that area and trying to get the formulas real simple so we could publish them where? Humanfactorinfo.com, but uh, <laughs> with instructions, no videos. But uh, I really found myself, every time I start thinking about doing something differently, I start saying, well, okay, here's what it's gonna cost, here's the return, here's how much money you need to get it done over this timetable. And suddenly you just start thinking that way a little bit, or a lot depending on who you are. But. And as you were talking earlier about the touchy-feely stuff, nor do you want to create amateur psychologists or sociologists or behavioral scientists in your organization. Yeah. But it's enough to think about it. You know, I'm reminded with this discussion of Voltaire, don't let the perfect be the enemy of, of the good. You know, when you look at strategy, which is what we're talking about here, strategy isn't a map, it's not a plan, it's not an exercise. Strategy is a way of thinking. And what I hear we're talking about here, it's a way of thinking. You don't need to create subject matter experts in, in this space, but you do need to affect the way people think about this. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Think about the value of what we're doing. Does this create real value? What data says that we should go in this direction? If we go in this direction, how do we be as efficient as possible and make sure that what we're doing is creating sustainable value? You know, there's all kinds of models you could leverage for that, but it's the thought process that I think it's gonna move the organization And forward. sometimes it's just simple thinking. I remember one of the, uh, we, you know, you've heard people talk about this before, but one of the uh, maintenance repair organizations, uh, or it was an airline, start on the parts bins actually putting the cost of every nut, bolt, and screw, and made people start thinking what it costs to replace that. Not to discourage them, because you do want to replace locking devices for a whole lot of reasons, uh, uh, but uh, it made people, be engineers begin to think about the, the, you know, the cost of the job that they do, Get one step at a time. My friends in the back have told me we're out of, out of time. We're at the end of our day. And I think that, to be honest with you, I think the Billy next time should have had you guys in big letters, and me in little letters, because you guys did a fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Nice Scott. Thank you, Scott. Scott's right. Next time, we won't let him make this slide up, so we'll, uh, we'll have somebody else do that. I just got a, yeah, a couple of quick... Um, 
thank yous to uh, to Bill and to uh, to Sean as a uh, as a token of uh, thank you, uh, thanks rather for uh, doing the plenary. Yeah, great to have you both presenting, thank and you. thank you very much for the Q and A session. I hope you found it useful. I was just uh, talking to Carl Fassenden and and, and said well, actually the uh, one of the topics was about reward, and it's always a sensitive issue. Uh, some people see it as a good thing, some people see it as a bad thing. But I'll share with you one example we saw when we went to visit Shell uh, gas plant in, in the UK. Uh, and they had, they had created a team of safety champions um, who were really running the safety program. The, the management had, had been able to take a step backwards. They fully supported it. They got briefed. They, uh, they gave resources. They did all the right stuff that management needed to do, but they'd really been able to step back and allow the, uh, the middle management and the workforce uh, at the grassroots level to run the safety program. And they developed a program themselves that, that involved a reward system, but it didn't reward the safety champions, so they didn't pay their reps as, as safety reps, but they, they put money into a, a fund uh, based on the results that they got, including proactive reporting for positive safety uh, activity as well. And at the end of the year, that, that committee that they had that ran it uh, decided which local good cause they donated that money to. So the company donated the, effectively the reward, but it went to a, a, a hospice or a, a, an organization that supported kids that, uh, that were, came from disadvantaged backgrounds, et cetera. And the, uh, the, the emotion and the power that that, uh, that that had and that fed back from the, uh, the actual safety committee was immense. So uh, it's another way of tackling it rather than rewarding individuals for doing safety work and, and doing it that way. They, they'd come up with what we thought was a, uh, an, an ingenious way of doing it. So we're looking at adopting the same. Anyway, I share that for what it's worth. I, uh, I, I drew a, a close on the, uh, on the discussion. I hope you found some of the, uh, the points uh, of interest stimulating debate, that's what it's all about. Um, I'm going to ask you now, uh, when I'm finished, to, uh, to gather all your belongings, because we need to rearrange this room into the other uh, workshops. So I will ask you to take all your stuff out of here. Uh, go upstairs for, uh, for some lunch. We've got a great buffet uh, set up. The hotel always does us proud with the, uh, with the food for the summit. And then it reconvenes, as per this, uh, the schedule, at 1.30. Have a look at the, uh, the program for any changes on the TV monitors if you haven't got the app and enjoyed the workshop. But thank you very much for your involvement this morning and thanks to all the guest speakers. Thank you.